On behalf of the STS and my co-director, Dr. Juan Umana, we are excited about the minimally invasive valve surgery course at STS University in San Diego, California. There is an increasing amount of data suggesting the clinical safety and efficacy of minimally invasive valve surgery. Unfortunately, acquiring this skill set can be difficult in real-world practice. The objective of this course is to provide a direct, hands-on experience dedicated to the newest techniques in minimally invasive aortic and mitral valve surgery. Our goal is to make minimally invasive valve surgery accessible to cardiothoracic surgeons. Participants will work in alternating pairs at each station to learn critical exposure and cannulation techniques for minimally invasive aortic and mitral surgery. Faculty for this course are recognized international experts in minimally invasive valve surgery with a passion for education. The approach for minimally invasive aortic surgery will be both via a right anterior thoracotomy and an upper hemisternotomy. For minimally invasive mitral surgery, the approach will be by way of lateral thoracotomy. Participants will then have the opportunity to perform aortic and mitral valve repair and replacement using high fidelity simulators under both direct vision and via thoroscopic guidance. For aortic valve replacement, participants will also get exposure to sutureless and rapid deployment technologies. There will be a total of seven stations for the course. These stations include a cannulation, exposure, and myocardial protection station, a mini AVR via upper hemisternotomy with sutured valves, a mini AVR via right anterior thoracotomy with sutured valves, a mini AVR via right anterior thoracotomy with sutureless valves, a mini AVR via right anterior thoracotomy with rapid deployment valves, mini mitral valve repair replacement under direct vision, and lastly, mini mitral valve repair replacement under thoroscopic vision. The rest of this video will focus on pearls and pitfalls of minimally invasive valve surgery. The discussion will be broken down into the following phases of the operation and focus on pearls and pitfalls. These phases include preoperative consideration, patient positioning, cannulation, and exposure. We recognize that there are many approaches to minimally invasive valve surgery and offer these suggestions as our personal preferred approach, realizing that there are many ways to perform minimally invasive valve surgery. We hope this video will be interactive and encourage viewers to post questions, comments, critiques, and suggestions. We also welcome additional pearls and pitfalls. Our overall goal is to facilitate the adoption of the required skills to perform minimally invasive valve surgery safely and effectively. There are several preoperative considerations worth noting. We selectively get a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis for preoperative planning. Several variables can make the operation more difficult, but does not necessarily preclude a minimally invasive approach. On the CT scan, we look at the positioning of the ascending aorta and the aortic valve. The aortic valve that is located towards the left chest and close to the sternum can make the operation more difficult. We also look at the caliber of the femoral artery at the level of, femoral, of the femoral head to ensure the ability to cannulate for cardiopulmonary bypass. Ideally, the femoral artery should be greater than 6 millimeters. A transophageal echo is preferred, but a transthoracic echo is reasonable. On echo, we look for evidence of aortic insufficiency, which can alter your cardioprotection strategy. We also look at the diameter of the left ventricular outflow tract, recognizing that a small aortic annulus may require an additional root enlargement procedure. With respect to cardioprotection, our preferred cardioplegia is Donito. We use one part blood and four parts Donito. We are comfortable with up to 90 minutes without having to redose. If at the 50 minute cross clamp mark, we feel we can finish the operation within the next 20 minutes, then we do not redose. If at the 50 minute mark, we feel like we will require more than 20 minutes, then we will redose approximately 300 to 400 cc's of Donito. Most of our patients receive one liter of cardioplegia. We use a single lumen endotracheal tube. A double lumen tube is not necessary. Our protocol is to go on peripheral cardiopulmonary bypass first, then to stop ventilation. This provides an unobstructed view of relevant structures. 
There have been some anecdotal reports of right lung reperfusion injury, and we believe this may be related to selective single lung ventilation with a double lumen tube. For those starting a minimally invasive program, we would recommend avoiding the following scenarios. Avoid patients that are reoperation. Avoid patients with severe aortic insufficiency. Avoid concomitant procedures. And avoid obese patients. We also recommend that, if possible, to have a proctor come by and observe your case. We prefer to expose the left femoral artery and vein for a peripheral cardiopulmonary bypass. The rationale is that patients often get a left heart catheterization prior to surgery, and this is usually performed through the right groin. Cannulation of the left groin helps avoid potentially having to dissect through a recently manipulated vessel, but in reality, it may not matter. Regarding cannula sizes, we prefer the Medtronic Biomedicus peripheral cannula, but any peripheral cannulation system should work. We determine the cannula size based off the following chart. It is important to cannulate the common femoral artery. It can be easy to confuse the profunda or the SFA for the common femoral artery. If in doubt, be sure to dissect proximally and visualize the inguinal ligament and visualize the profunda and the SFA. With respect to dissection, you do not need to expose the femoral artery and the femoral vein circumferentially. Exposing the anterior surface is sufficient. It is also important to avoid extensive dissection to avoid injury to lymphatic vessels. On occasion, there may be a significant resistance when advancing the arterial cannula. When this occurs, we prefer to make a small nick at the site of the arteriotomy site to avoid the potential of an iatrogenic dissection. It's important to make sure the wire for the venous cannula is in the SVC. It can be easy for the wire to either sit in the right atrium or the right ventricle, and this runs the risk of an iatrogenic perforation when advancing the venous cannula. It's important to make sure your cardiac anesthesiologist gets you a good echo by cable view with visibility of the SVC and IVC. You should be able to directly see the wire advance up the SVC, as seen here. If you're unable to get the wire up the SVC, Several troubleshooting moves include the following. You can place a bend in the wire and manipulate the wire during advancing into the SVC. You can have your anesthesia colleagues apply positive pressure ventilation to help redirect the wire into the SVC. And as a last resort, a portable C-arm fluoroscopy unit may be required to directly visualize and manipulate the wire into the SVC. Another pearl has to do with the appropriate length and depth of the venous cannula. It is helpful prior to advancing the venous cannula to place a cannula on the patient's body to get an idea of how deep to advance a cannula as seen here. Lastly, with respect to venous drainage, it's preferable to have vacuum-assisted cardiopulmonary bypass. We would now like to discuss pearls of pitfalls with respect to exposure. The anagrade cardioplegia site can be a frequent source of bleeding. We prefer to use a 14 gauge angiocath needle with a 10 French red rubber catheter as a stopper for our anti-grade needle, as is seen in this picture here. The smaller size needle will hopefully minimize the likelihood of bleeding at the site of the anti-grade. It's important to let perfusionists know that the anti-grade is being delivered through a smaller needle and to expect higher line pressures. When placing the pacing wire, it's important to place the RV pacing wire before releasing the aortic cross clamp. Our preferred location is at the base of the right ventricle and diaphragm. Our preferred approach is to use a sponge stick in our left hand for exposure and the pacing wire in the right hand. Let's now discuss pearls and pitfalls relevant for minimally invasive aortic valve surgery. Although it might be tempting, we recommend not making the surgical incision too low. This is a typical incision location for our minimal invasive aortic valve replacement. As you can see in the coronal radiograph, the aortic valve is relatively low. The temptation is to make the skin incision at the level of the aortic valve. The problem with this approach is that you end up looking at the aortic valve at a cant, and it may be difficult to see all the aortic leaflets. We recommend making the skin incision slightly higher so you're able to look down the barrel of the aortic valve. 
Below are pictures of our typical aortic valve incisions. Another pearl is to make your aortotomy at the same location as the anti-grade needle delivery site. Again, the anti-grade needle site can be a frustrating location for bleeding. By making your aortotomy at this location, you close the anti-grade needle site when closing your aorta, thus minimizing the risk of bleeding. At times, the right atrial appendage may obstruct your aortic root. A pearl is to place a tourniquet around the right atrium and gently pull the tourniquet through a proposed chest tube site. This effectively retracts the right atrial appendage towards the feet and helps expose the aortic root. Our last pearl with respect to minimally invasive aortic valve surgery is to take your time when closing the aortotomy. This may sound obvious, but placing repair sutures once a cross clamp has been removed can be challenging, especially along the medial border of the aorta next to the PA. Take your time when closing the aortotomy so that no repair sutures are needed. Let's now focus and discuss pearls and pitfalls for minimally invasive mitral valve surgery. With respect to the incision, it's best to make the incision more lateral. This may sound counterintuitive, but a lateral incision will give you a more direct view of the mitral valve. Below are pictures of our typical mitral valve surgical incisions. After making your skin incision and before committing to an inner space, we often make a small hole in the intercostal space and feel with our finger the, the location of the diaphragm. If the diaphragm is too high, then you can go up one inner space. Next, at times, the diaphragm will obstruct your view. Instead of using diaphragm retraction sutures, which may injure the diaphragm, we place sutures at the corner of the pericardium. The sutures can be seen placed here. The sutures are then pulled through the chest tube wall at a site of a potential chest tube site. By pulling on these sutures, the diaphragm will be retracted down, exposing your field of interest. We hope this video was helpful in introducing the STS University Minimally Invasive Valve course, as well as providing some pearls and pitfalls for minimally invasive valve surgery. We encourage interaction and feedback regarding this video and welcome questions, critiques, and additional pearls and pitfalls by clicking on the comment section below. We hope to see you at the STS University.